This video is sponsored by JLC PCB. Hello everyone. Today I would like to share one of the projects that I've been working on for a while, a DIY full frame CD camera. I've been doing electronics DIY for over a decade now, and I've also loved taking photos. So it's a natural idea of wanting to build a camera myself. I finally got some sort of prototype machine I can show, so here I'm making a video to share this project. I will go through the design and the building process of this project. Given it's not fully finished yet, there will be a part 2 on the improvements of the current design. Let's start with the design. Because it's DIY, I want things to be simplified. What's the bare minimum I can get away with? Film, shutter, and lens. I want to build a digital camera so the film is replaced with the sensor and related circuits. The shutter is also quite a complicated part, and mechanical design is not my expertise, so I'll skip this part by using electronic shutter. So at this stage, this is already a camera that can take photos, but it's not super useful because it still lacks a viewfinder. What's my option here? One is to add a rangefinder on the side, but this creates challenges in zooming and focusing. Another is to make it into an SLR camera, with reflect mirrors and lenses. This yields good results, but building it also is way beyond my skill level. The easiest way to do is just use an electronic viewfinder, using the display to show the image preview. The advantage, beyond easy to implement, is that the end result should closely match the preview. It comes with multiple downsides as well, such as higher power consumption, high latency, potential poor outdoor visibility, etc. To keep things simple, I'm going with electronic viewfinder this time. The next task is to select specific components for the build. Starting with the lens, rather than saying selecting a lens, I'm selecting a lens mount. To avoid reverse engineering the lens protocols, sticking with a manual lens would be the logical choice for now. There are a few lens mounts with a lot of manual lenses. My camera is a mirrorless one, so it's possible to keep the flange distance short. So I'm planning to use the M mount for now. The next item is the sensor. Unfortunately, it's not really up to me of what sensor to use. I got to pick what shows up on the used market. Sensors typically used in cameras, such as Sony IMAX sensors, while they're pretty good, typically require NDA in place for the full data sheet and are hard to source. Another possibility is to buy sensors pulled from industrial cameras. Sometimes they come with freely available data sheets. I was lucky enough to get a bunch of Kodak KI 11000 CM sensors. Their 11 megapixel interline transfer CD with 35 mm full frame optical format, supporting global electronic shutter. To drive this CCD, I chose the AD9990 CCD AFE and ADC with an integrated timing generator from analog devices. Then, for the processor, I chose the IMAX RT1176 microcontroller from NNXP. Obviously, there are many different possible solutions. You can go entirely with CMOS sensors and save a lot of headaches, or for CCD, one can use FPGA to do the timing generation, or use system on chip FPGAs like Vink to provide better performance, etc. I went with this just because I thought it was going to be straightforward, which turned out not to be the case. Not because this is a bad solution. For the screen, high PPI is one of the goals. I picked this 4 inch 720x720 720 screen with a capacitive touchscreen so I don't need to worry about accommodating tactile switches and such. For the battery, I use these fairly standard dual 18650 battery modules. Once I'm done with selecting components, I can start designing the circuit. Unfortunately, I don't really have the recording of the whole design process. The best I can do is to show you the current design. There is nothing special about the processing part, it's really just the processor, RAM, and flash. The CCD is a bit harder to drive, it takes 6 different clock signals, I mentioned I used a fully integrated IC from ADI, it generates all the necessary signals from one side and takes the output signal from CCD on another side. It handles the amplification, sampling, and conversions with minimal external circuits. Since we're here, let's go over how these signals work on a high level. Assume I got a 4x4 CCD here. The process starts with an electronic front curtain. It clears all the remaining charges on the device. Then the incoming light would be converted to charges. Once the exposure is done, all the accumulated charges would be transferred from licensing elements to storage elements. This is what makes global shutter possible. The interline transfer in the name refers to this. 
There are also full-frame CDs as a counterpart. Note the full frame here does not refer to the optical format, but rather means the entire area is used for light sensing elements. For the interline ones, less area means now it needs micro lens to focus the light into a narrower window to compensate. Obviously, the full wheel capacity or the amount of charges it could hold before overhaul would decrease. This reduces the maximum possible SNR. Back to the signals, so far all the charges are already in the storage area. The next task is readout. By toggling the vertical clock, all the bottom pixels can be shifted out to the output buffer. Then by toggling the horizontal clock, pixels can be shifted out individually. The output can now be buffered, amplified, and sampled. Back to the circuits. While the ADI chip could generate all these signals, unfortunately, none of the CCD inputs take ordinary 3.3 or 5 volt logic signals. To generate these voltage levels, first I need all the necessary power supplies. I use several split rail DC-DC converters and some linear regulators here. The specific design is actually quite bad, and it will be fixed in the next revision. Now onto driving these signals. The CCD not only takes a rather high voltage input, but it also has a huge load. For example here, the vertical clocks have over 100 picofarad load and it requires less than 1 microsecond rise time. This is way beyond the driving capability of typical microcontroller or 74 logic IC I.O. pins. So I'm using dedicated MOSFETs here. I'm also using the 4053 analog multiplexer as a versatile logic shifter here. The horizontal clock have a much lower load, so they could be driven with just 74 with logic shifters. Then onto the PCB design, which is really just connecting things together. I used a fairly large screen, so there is a lot of space. About why the screen is big, that's because the battery is big. I still want to make it as thin as possible, so I choose these types of connectors from Harwin. Otherwise, it's pretty standard. It's just an experimental board, so I didn't spend much effort on the SDRAM routing. No lens matching, and I didn't obey the 3W rule, but it works. Once the design is done, I can go and let the sponsor JLC PCB to build it. It's recommended to install the JLC PCB plugin by Benny. So it's one click to generate all the production files. Just upload the file and confirm the settings, then it's good to go. To save some time, I also use JLC's assembly service to solder some of the components. Once the board is back, I can solder the remaining parts. By the time I record this footage, the debugging is mostly done so you can see some bulge wires. The next step is designing the enclosure. I have to say this is not its final form. This is really just supposed something I can quickly put together to test the sensor with some lenses. I also use JLC for 3D printing, it's much easier than setting up an SRA printer at home, which I've done so before. Looks good actually, but I will write the code first to make sure it works. Starting with the easy part, the DSi screen. That's straightforward. Similar to other parallel or spy screens, it needs some initialization sequence to configure the power supply, lookup table, etc. Then switch into the video mode when it's quite similar to an RGB screen. Then onto the real deal, the CCD. I've already covered the signal timing needed to make it work. Now the task is just translating these configurations into register settings. This chip got tons of registers and it's really versatile. But all I got is a datasheet without any application note or example code. All I can do is read the manual 10 times, write down some code, experiment, and then construct the waveform by trial and error. This is taking way longer than I expected. If I were to write some Verilog and FPGA, that would take less than a day. But hey, signals are here. If now I enable the CSI on the processor, I capture the image and display on the screen, I should be able to see it. Like put something on the CCD. But to take some photos, I need a lens. So time to assemble the case. I designed it to be super easy to put together. As I said, this is really just, just a temporary solution. I need to rework on this later. Turn it on again, and now I can see some images. But obviously, it's not right. It's all monochrome with the wrong direction, wrong size. The direction is easy to understand because the image is inverted after the lens. Regarding the size, that's because the CCD used dual channel readout from both the left and right side. But once it hits a processor, the processor has no idea about that and just stores them into the memory, alternating between two sides. If I display them sequentially, this is what I get. Then for the color, well, I didn't even assign them color to begin with. 
You've probably heard that one pixel consists of RGB three subpixels, but on the camera, unless you are using like 4VM X3 or 3CCD systems, chances are there are no subpixels on it. Each pixel only has one single color. Once the capturing is done, the software interpolates the missing colors. Of course, the interpolation process or the debayering process is a quite complex topic on its own, and I'm not going into the details here. Adding them all together, I can now see the image with correct color, but it's really slow. That's easy to understand as well. There is a total of 11 megapixels. ADC runs at 24 megahertz, so that's 24 megapixel per second. With dual channels, that's 48 megapixel per second. 48 divided by 11, that's about 4 point something. The solution is also straightforward, just skip some lines. But it's not a perfect solution. Once the line has started readout, it's impossible to skip pixels in between. The horizontal resolution cannot be changed. So the final result is, to achieve 25 FPS, the resolution needs to be cut down to 240p. To control shutter speed and ISO sensitivity, I made a very simple UI here. I haven't going to implement the sensitivity control, but shutter speed control is here, with real-time feedback. I have some issues in my code, changing the shutter speed also changes the live view frame rate. I haven't installed the physical shutter button yet, so the on-screen touch control will do for now. Pressing the shutter release, well, release the shutter. Then it shows the captured image and saves it to the SD card. Insert the SD card on PC and photos are here. I haven't implemented any export features on the camera, so for now a small utility on PC is used for doing the basic image processing. Thanks Yuki Damayaki-san for helping out on this part. Here are some really bad sample photos for you to look at. So that's about what I have right now. In the next episode, I will dive into the user interface, improvements, more photos, and some behind the scenes stories. Thanks for watching. I will see you in the next video and comment area. Bye.